Are you sure you'll be able to bring it up? Yeah, I'll bring it up. Are we on? Yeah. Hello, welcome back to Fertility Factor Fiction. Great to have you guys back. Excited to have another opportunity to bring some new and really important information to light. And we have a interesting show with not one but two studies today to review with you. So hopefully that'll be um, something we can all explore and learn from together. I hope you've had a good week. Uh, obviously nothing too momentous happening. All of us just trying to survive COVID. Uh, parts of Ontario open up tomorrow, so that's exciting. And we are just loading up on Instagram, hopefully shortly. Um, so we're gonna give everybody a chance to grab their tea and coffee. I have my uh, Tetley apple cinnamon or something other tea. Um, so grab something to drink. Uh, we've got a good show, interesting topic, which is uh, uh, whether or not diminished ovarian reserve impacts the chances that your embryo will be genetically normal. And then we even have a little bit of data about live birth. So it should be really, really good info for everyone to know about, especially if you're suffering with diminished ovarian reserve, which is so frustrating for patients that are out there. So uh, grab something to eat or drink, uh, pull up a chair, and uh, we'll uh, have the show for you on in just a minute. <clears throat> Are we uh, almost ready to go? Yeah, I think. <laughs> so uh, hopefully those of you who have had a chance to see our vaccine video know that um, everyone is recommending that patients who are trying to conceive or who are pregnant get the vaccine for COVID. And uh, we support that as well. Uh, most of the information out there are about the negative aspects of the vaccine are not actually accurate or uh, not validated. I've now had my second shot, and aside from the fact that it was very mildly tender for a couple of days, um, I've had no side effects whatsoever with the second shot. And I had heard a lot of people say that the second shot really had a lot more side effects than the first, but we're really not experiencing that at all, or at least I didn't really experience that at all. So, so far so good. I haven't seen anything weird or awkward happening. Okay, so uh, the topic that we have tonight is surrounding whether or not patients with diminished ovarian reserve suffer from a higher rate of aneuploid or genetically abnormal embryos than patients with normal ovarian reserve. So as it so happens, um, right around the same time, two separate journals are publishing two separate articles uh, by different people on the same topic. So one is in Fertility and Sterility, it's uh, right here, and it's called Diminished Ovarian Reserve is Associated with Reduced Euploid Rates via Pre-Implantation Genetic Testing for Aneuploidy Independently from Age. Uh, evidence for concomitant reduction in oocyte quality with quantity. And then the other one is called euploidy rates of embryos in young patients with good and low prognosis according to the Poseidon criteria. So I'm gonna go through each one and we'll talk about them each and then we can kind of figure out what they each say. So the first study uh, is by Eleni greenwood Jaswa, and this is from the University of California in San Francisco. So essentially what they did was they took 225 women uh, which had diminished ovarian reserve through the Bologna criteria. So the Bologna criteria are either one abnormal ovarian reserve test, AMH, FSH, and so on, a previous poor response during a cycle, advanced maternal age, or another risk factor for uh, poor ovarian reserve. And you have to have two of those three in order to qualify. So for those patients, they basically uh, included them all and they excluded women whose age was over 42, saying that their, the age was playing the majority of the role rather than the fact that it was just diminished ovarian reserve at a more younger or normal age. So um, they properly for this type of study excluded them and so I think that's really important for everyone to be aware of. So what they did was they analyzed the data and they were essentially comparing two groups. They had one group of women that had diminished ovarian reserve and that's the 225 and they had a control group of 927 women who did not have diminished ovarian reserve. 
all of these patients had gone through IVF, all of these patients had had pre-implantation genetic testing. So uh, welcome to our Instagram friends um, as they're logging on. Sorry it took us a minute to get you guys on. There's always some kind of glitch with Instagram. I hate Instagram actually, but anyways. So essentially what they did was they compared these two groups together and they wanted to see what the results were. So what they said was that there is overall there was 8073 blastocysts in the study so a pretty robust number of blastocysts to be evaluated and that came from just over a thousand women who had gone through various cycles of IVF and so what they said was that when you looked overall at the numbers they didn't necessarily see uh, significant differences between different types of techniques that were used but overall when they compared women age specified groups, so less than 35, 35 to 37, 38 to 40, 41 to 42, and then overall, they were seeing differences between the diminished ovarian reserve group and the non-diminished ovarian reserve group. So if we can get table two up from the first study, you should be able to see that um, somewhere on the page here. And if you see the age number less than 35, it's 42.8% for the women with diminished ovarian reserve versus 54.8% for the women that had normal ovarian reserve or non-diminished ovarian reserve. So, you know, a 12-fold different or 12% difference uh, in outcomes there. 35 to 37, they said there actually wasn't a difference because it's 50.3 and then 50.2. So interesting that in that particular age group, you're at that crossover point where you're not really seeing a significant impact of the diminished ovarian reserve. 38 to 40, 27.5% for the women with diminished ovarian reserve, 40.8% for the non. 41 to 42, 22.4 versus 25.6, a smaller difference because now age is becoming more of a factor. And overall, when they looked at this, it's about a 15, almost 16% difference, 29% versus 44.9%. So quite a significant difference, in other words, showing that the number of euploid or genetically normal embryos you're going to produce if you have diminished ovarian reserve is reduced. And when they actually calculated this, they said it's a 23% reduction in your chances of developing a genetically normal embryo compared to someone that does not have a diminished ovarian reserve. So then they went through the data a little bit further and they said, what about when we're expecting, you know, the ovarian reserve to be lower uh, and, and kind of predicting it? And they did show again that based on those patients, when they broke it down into the two groups, you do see significantly less euploid embryos in the diminished ovarian reserve group with the exception of that 35 to 37 age group. But then on table three, so if you can pull up table three for us, they then looked at whether or not the pregnancy outcomes were different. And here's where it's really critically interesting to have a look. So if you look at not pregnant at all, it was 34.7% in the diminished ovarian reserve group, 34.2% in the non-diminished ovarian reserve group. So no difference. Biochemical pregnancy, 4.2 in diminished ovarian reserve, 3.9 in the non. So again, no difference. Clinical miscarriage rate, 3.2 versus 6.8. So it's actually lower in the diminished ovarian reserve group. Ectopic pregnancy, 1.1 versus 0.4. And the most important factor here, live birth, 56.8 versus 54.8, which had no statistically significant difference. Why is this important? Because yes, you are at an increased chance of having fewer genetically normal embryos if you have diminished ovarian reserve. But as long as you have a genetically normal embryo, you have absolutely no difference in the live birth outcome. So if you have diminished ovarian reserve, you get a genetically normal embryo, you're not at a decreased risk of getting pregnant. You're at the same chance of getting pregnant as someone that doesn't have diminished ovarian reserve and is also producing genetically normal embryos, which is hugely important because it means all you need to do is try until you get to the point where you have genetically normal embryos. 
How many times will that take? Well, we have our embryo math video, so you should watch that on YouTube. It's a great video that defines how many tries it takes. There's lots of data out there. And for some people, you need to have a line in the sand, so to speak, where you know that you are stopping your tries at IVF after a certain point in time, because it's not really worth trying over and over and over again if you're not getting a good outcome. However, overall, there is a reasonable chance that if you try sufficient number of times, you will get a genetically normal embryo. And based on this data, with even just one embryo at a time, you're looking at a very reasonable chance of having a live birth that is no different from someone that does not have a genetically, uh, or sorry, have a diminished ovarian reserve. So this is really, really valuable data because it means for all those of you who have diminished ovarian reserve, the key is to continue trying. I am not encouraging people to spend their life's fortune on IVF cycles because I don't think that should be done. I actually believe people should have a line in the sand. And for me, that's usually around two or three cycles of IVF. But this reassures us that if you try those two or three times, hopefully you'll get that one or two normal, genetically normal embryos. And if you have those, you should have success in achieving a live birth no different than anyone else who is not going through the same difficulties you are. So very, very helpful data. They basically go on to define that because you are seeing less uh, quality of the, the genetic normalness of the embryos with the patients with diminished ovarian reserve, this must be related to egg number because those patients did have less eggs. So in other words, lower egg number with diminished ovarian reserve does suggest that you will have genetically fewer normal embryos. So that's important because your egg count and your embryo normalness will be associated with another based on this study. But they're saying that once you get the genetically normal embryo, you still have a very good chance. The second study is from a group in Turkey. So they took a slightly different approach. They only used women less than 35 years of age and they focused on something called Poseidon criteria. So Poseidon criteria has different groups. Group one, which they selected, were suboptimal responders. So you were less than 35, your antral follicle count was greater than five, but the number of eggs they retrieved was less than 10. Group three was the expected low responder, which was, again, age less than 35, your antral follicle count was less than five, and then they had a third group where they compared women who just had normal response and they were not expected to have a poor response. So the inclusion criteria was just women less than 35 who underwent IVF. And the ones that they excluded were women that did not have um, a conventional ovarian stimulation. So if they were doing like duo stim or a natural cycle and those with severe, severe male factor which was less than two million per mil in this study because they said that that didn't make a lot of sense for them. And then they also excluded non-GNRH antagonist protocols. So if you had a, a microdose flare protocol or a letrozole cycle or something like that, those were also excluded. So this is a very narrow study population that they were looking at. And of course they removed structural rearrangement. So balanced translocations, reciprocal translocations were removed because those have a very different outcome than, than other groups. So essentially in this study, um, and we're going to table uh, two, I don't know if you have that one up or not. Do you have this guy? Yeah. So we're gonna show you that study as well. So it's a comparison of the cycle embryological characteristics and PGTA results um, among the three groups. So group A had on average two blastocysts retrieved, or sorry, analyzed. Group B, which was the low ovarian reserve, had just one, and the normal group had three. And this was statistically significantly different between the two groups, meaning you are less likely to develop as many blastocysts if you have the diminished ovarian reserve. They then looked at the number of cycles that were canceled prior to insemination, so prior to actually putting the sperm into the eggs, okay? So in the group that was uh, the group one with the kind of suboptimal response, it was 6.8%. In the poor ovarian responders, it was 14.3% and it was only 0.9% in the normal responders. 
again, highly statistically significant. The number of cycles that were canceled because they didn't even get a blastocyst, 16.5% in the suboptimal responders, significant. So you need to know going into those cycles that there's a pretty reasonable chance you could end up with nothing. 32.3% in the diminished ovarian reserve. So one third of patients even trying those cycles will end up with no blastocyst. And then only 7.4% in the group that had normal ovarian response, which is kind of unusually high. We don't have a 7.4% rate of failure to get to blastocyst in our, study, in our data population. I mean, I would really be wondering what's wrong. So that kind of gave me a little bit of pause to think maybe this particular center is not getting exactly the same results as everybody else's because that's a very, very high rate. So when they actually compared the number of genetically normal embryos per embryo tested, there's actually no difference in this study. So when you look at it per embryo tested, they showed that it's got the same percentage chance of being genetically normal when you look at it at a per embryo chance, but remember that you had a much lower chance of even getting to that embryo. So the data is important here because it's saying getting to the embryo has a lower chance but in this study, they're showing kind of the opposite of the other one, which is that if you get to the point where you have a embryo there, it has the same percentage of being normal that the other groups did. So interesting data, because this is kind of saying a different result from what the previous study did. Same kind of study analysis, just different populations and obviously a different, different place. This one's from Turkey, so I don't know if that study population is significantly different, different than the American population. The other thing they looked at was the number of cycles that had at least one embryo that was normal. So 63.9% in the suboptimal group had at least one that was normal. 36.8% in the group that was diminished ovarian reserve. And then 83.3% in the group that was normal. So these are really important numbers because they tell you you have a very reasonable chance of having a genetically normal embryo if you're going into a cycle and you have normal ovarian response if you're less than 35, so 83.3% chance of having one. You have a pretty decent chance even if you have diminished ovarian reserve. Over a third of patients will have at least one genetically normal embryo. And if you have suboptimal, you have a pretty good chance, almost two thirds chance that you'll have a genetically normal embryo. And remember, for every one, you have around a 60% chance of success. So that's quite good to see if we can get at least one normal embryo. So what they concluded was that essentially there was no real difference in the outcomes per embryo, but getting to that embryo had a significant difference if you had diminished ovarian reserve. They also analyzed this based on the protocol that was used in terms of dose of the stimulation. So lots of patients are asking us every week, what about mini IVF? What about mini stimulation? What about natural cycle? So they actually analyzed whether the outcomes were related to the dosage of medication that patients received and looked at, did that impact the chance that you would have a genetically normal embryo? And there was absolutely no relationship between your dose and the outcome. So whether you're on a minimal stim or a high stim, you're not gonna see a difference. But the one difference that we know is that you probably have a better chance of producing more eggs if you're on a slightly higher dose. Not super high doses, because that probably has negative effects, but like a moderate to high dose will likely yield more embryos than a low dose will. So is it a fact or a fiction? that diminished ovarian reserve can cause an increase in aneuploidy or abnormal embryo formation. It would appear that it does based on the overall population of embryos, but if you're looking at it at a per embryo chance, you actually have the same chances as anyone else. And what's really important is your live birth rates appear to be the same once you have that genetically normal embryo. So this hopefully will provide a lot of women out there with a tremendous amount of hope because it suggests that if you try, you will likely have a chance that is very reasonable and almost equivalent to what other women who are trying and do not suffer from diminished ovarian reserve will have. So make sure you watch this on YouTube. If you get a chance, you can like, comment, share, and as always, please subscribe to our channel. 
it's growing by about 20 to 30 people per day and we've got thousands and thousands of views on many of our videos so appreciate you joining us for this one and make sure you stay tuned uh, next week we'll have another exciting topic we're open now to our questions and i think tarik's going to read them out you guys should be able to hear him because he's sitting right next to me he wants to be on the show so if you guys want tarik to come on live one day and take my place lots of thumbs up for that and we'll see how it goes uh, fire away first question hello my naturopath prescribed me some oral and vaginal probiotics via full script and i just received them in the mail i did not notice that they are not dairy free therefore i would have igf1 which will make my pcos worse how much will it actually affect my PCOS? Should I just skip these and continue taking my vegan probiotics? Is there any studies regarding vaginal probiotics for recurring yeast infections? Um, there are probiotics for recurring yeast infections and they have shown a benefit. So that's an easy one. Um, as far as the impact on your IGF-1 related to dairy and PCOS, that's gonna have an absolutely negligible impact from what's going in through the vagina from a probiotic. So I would not be concerned about that at all. I can't say that there are studies that have looked at that. I'm certainly not aware of any, but I would think that that would have an absolutely negligible study. Unless your probiotic is chock full of sugar, your IGF-1 is not gonna be impacted by the presence of a small amount of dairy. So that's not something I would worry about at all. Great question though. Um, no one's ever asked us anything like that. So yeah, I, I wouldn't be worried about that. That's of minimal, minimal concern. We actually use probiotics in all of our IVF embryo transfers. Um, so we give our patients antibiotics and then we give them probiotics to make sure that we are getting optimal vaginal and hopefully uterine flora. And there are studies and we've reviewed it on previous Fact or Fiction that demonstrate that the um, outcomes are better when you have improved vaginal flora there. So I think the minimal effect on PCOS, even if there was one, and I don't believe there would be, would be far outweighed by the benefit of getting the right bacteria there. Hi, Dr. V. Have you ever seen blood results like this in a patient? Low vitamin D, high ferritin, elevated CRP, and high STD rates. Any speculations on what this could mean? Thank you. Uh, wow, I mean, I would need to know your whole history to answer a question like that. Low vitamin D though can mess with a lot of things. High ferritin, I mean, would depend on what's going on. Um, so we'd need to know a lot more about you. Uh, definitely something you should follow up with either one of us or your family physician or an even, even an internal medicine specialist for. Um, but I would need to know more about your history to figure that out. If I am 26 and have diminished ovarian reserve and in uni cornuate uterus, what's the likelihood of using my own egg? Uh, very high. Based on what we just shared with you, you should actually have an excellent chance, um, especially if you're really young. The reality is we can probably get some eggs from you still, unless it's extremely diminished to the point where you're premenopausal or menopausal. And as long as we can get some, you still have a robust chance of success. You may need to try several times and there are financial realities there that are important to recognize, but you can still achieve success. Unicorn uterus does not stop you from getting pregnant. It increases your risks of delivering early and it also increases your risk of having the baby breach, which means you'd need a cesarean section, but it doesn't diminish success rates. So that's not a concern. Um, we've had many, many women that are unicornuate and that's never been a problem. Yeah, so don't worry about that. And if you can afford it or you're in an area where you have insurance, by all means go for it because you should have a very reasonable chance of success. So I'd encourage you to try. From the gram. If someone has MTHFR 667 CT and a PAI 1, yeah. 4 gram, 5 gram heterogeneous, how long is it necessary to stay on Fragment? This topic seems to be so controversial. So actually, um, we would keep you on Fragment throughout the pregnancy and for six weeks, four to six weeks after the pregnancy, because that's your highest risk time of thrombophilia where you can end up having a blood clot. So with all of that in mind, 
we start our patients before we do the transfer. If it's a, an IVF cycle, we keep you on it throughout the whole pregnancy, and then we would stop it about four to six weeks after because you are at an increased risk of blood clots, and it's high during the pregnancy, and it's even higher after the pregnancy. Great question. Samantha on Instagram says, Hello, Doc. Good morning to you and also to everyone here. God bless you all. Oh, thank you, Samantha. That's very sweet of you. All right. God bless you too. And God bless everyone watching. Does DOR typically yield less eggs at egg retrieval? Oh, for sure. So if you have diminished ovarian reserve, you're going to have less eggs at egg retrieval. Absolutely. Now, interestingly, um, in that study that we showed you from Turkey, the average number of eggs they retrieved in the suboptimal group was 11. So that's pretty high for being suboptimal. Um, but I guess, you know, whatever they were doing was reasonable, but that's not necessarily mature eggs. So yeah, for sure you're going to have fewer eggs in someone that has suboptimal ovarian or poor ovarian reserve. Um, one thing we've been doing quite a bit of lately because we discounted it to make it easier for our patients to engage in is the duo stim where we do them back to back. And actually, uh, just recently we had one client who had uh, reasonable egg yield the first cycle, but actually none of them made it to blastocyst. And then we did it again with her second cycle during duo stim, so back to back IVF. And she ended up with four really beautiful blastocysts. So, um, I think there is something very strong about the duo stim that works, and there is probably some benefit to doing that. So there are ways, even if you have diminished ovarian reserve, to kind of up the game and, and give you a better chance. But per cycle, compared to someone that does not have diminished ovarian reserve, you're definitely going to get fewer eggs for sure. And, and that's just the biology of this, not anything we're happy about. And we do everything we can to maximize it for you. But realistically, you have to go into it anticipating you'll, you'll have fewer eggs and that you may need more tries. Hi, Dr. Victory. Is there a way to naturally lower high testosterone levels with PCOS? Yeah. So uh, there's lots of ways. So number one, um, you can take metformin and letrozole. So not natural, but uh, medical. Number two, the supplements will likely eventually help you. How much they impact testosterone, we don't know, but overall they should yield a benefit. So the three that are proven that we use all the time are uh, coenzyme Q10, inositol, and NAC, and acetylcysteine. So all three of those have proven benefits for PCOS. The last part of it, if you are in the PCOS category that is the non thin PCOS category, you have to eat healthy, which is six meals a day, no more than 1500 calories per day, low carb diet, and you must exercise doing muscle building exercise, which will drop the adipose tissue. By dropping the adipose tissue, you will reverse a lot of that testosterone creation, and that should significantly diminish your testosterone levels. So you have to lose the adipose tissue. And the only way to do that is eat healthy. I don't love the word diet and to exercise, to build muscle. And, and I say this every show, walking is not exercise guys. So that does not help anybody. You have to actually do a workout video. We typically recommend focus T25. It's available on beachbody.com. I have no financial relationship with Beachbody. I don't work for them. I don't promote them. Um, but I've done the video myself, it works. Um, and it's very, very uh, simple because it's only 25 minutes a day and it requires zero equipment. So you can do that. Uh, I read about it a lot before I started it. And there were many, many people on the web saying that they had lost 40 pounds, 30 pounds, 20 pounds, 60 pounds. So I can attest to the fact that you will get in good shape doing that workout video. I was probably in the best shape I've ever been in. And uh, based on the greasy dinner Tarek and I had tonight, I probably need to do it again. So um, we'll probably be restarting that. Maybe I'll video that because it seems like everybody wants to see people working out these days. So maybe we'll show you our, uh, our journey. I don't know if you guys want to watch workouts, but uh, if you do, I'd be happy to share that too. So not a question, but okay. going to Facebook. Hello, Doc. I don't have any questions. 
Because I'm pregnant, mm-hmm. 15 weeks. Your voice and personality gives me so much positivity. Well, awesome. So I'm here listening to you. God bless you. Oh, thank you. Well, first of all, congratulations on being pregnant. And thank you for uh, the kind words. And God bless you as well. Thank you for watching and supporting us and for supporting the community that's watching us. That's amazing. Thank you very much. On Instagram, would you still prescribe Lupron prior to IVF for endo if you recently had laparoscopic surgery to remove it? Would a IVF protocol be different for someone with endo? So, um, okay, so we don't prescribe Lupron prior to your stim for uh, patients with endo because they've actually looked at that in a study and it didn't help. Vizan showed benefit, but Lupron has not. So you don't necessarily need to use um, Lupron prior to IVF, especially if you've just had surgery, you can just go right into your surgery. If you're talking about um, after you've done your egg retrieval, there are studies that demonstrate that three months of Lupron with letrozole for patients with endometriosis is beneficial and gives you an increased success rate. Um, So lately I've been warning people that there are women that claim that Lupron can cause very severe lifelong side effects. I have not seen that in my practice, but that doesn't mean that it's not true. So now I wanna warn everybody that there are lots of women out there claiming that it has a very detrimental side effects. And I'm hoping this weekend coming that if I find time on the Sunday, we'll probably try and have a little mini conference with some of those women. Uh, to organize like a a Zoom meeting and see what their experiences have been and see if there's a way to study this somehow. So in any event, up until we get more data, yes, we do use Lupron and Letrozole. Um, I have used it literally thousands of times with no one ever complaining about it. And it seems to work quite well. um, And that normalizes things. So leading up to your embryo transfer, yes, but not leading up to your egg retrieval. The last part of that question was, is there a a special protocol? And as I just mentioned, yeah, there is. So that's what we do. We use Lupron and Letrozole leading up to your embryo transfer, but not up to your IVF cycle. My husband has DNA fragmentation and lower sperm motility and count. We will do ICSI, but will this have a significant impact on our chances of a genetically normal embryo? I'm 38 years old and he's 40. So uh, ICSI does not impact the genetic normalcy of your embryos at all. Um, The sperm DNA fragmentation also doesn't necessarily alter the chance of aneuploidy. Um, We're not sure about that. They're still studying that. But what we do know is that it increases the chances of miscarriage. So I would strongly recommend that you identify why he has high sperm DNA fragmentation and address that. So smoking, drinking, drug use, excessive heat, excessive weight, diabetes, um, certain medications can do that. Uh, And then correct those, especially with uh, high vitamin use and intake, because that has been shown to reduce sperm DNA fragmentation. And then there are multiple different ways to improve the sperm DNA fragmentation at the time of IVF. So number one, there's a device we use called Zymo. Uh, Number two, a second ejaculate, three hours after the first will reduce it. And number three, swim up techniques have also been shown as promising techniques to reduce the amount of sperm DNA fragmentation. So there are a number of different ways to achieve a higher chance that you're getting low sperm DNA fragmentation and you can use one or all of those um, for your patients. So that's something you should be talking to your center about and they should be familiar with those things, although I do find that a lot of centers aren't. So for our patients with high DNA frag, we're using multiple techniques to make sure we get the best sperm uh, possible when we do our ICSI. Um, From Instagram, hi Doc Rahi. I want to find out regarding relationship between sperm volume and low testosterone. Is there a correlation and what is the treatment? So sperm volume, if you mean ejaculate volume, no. But if you mean sperm concentration, yes, because the signal from your brain to tell your testicles to make testosterone is the same one that tells them to make sperm. So if your T is low, you're also probably not getting enough signal to make sperm. So there are ways to increase that. Um, Again, you gotta address what the source problem is. So if the brain's not sending enough signal, you can give men 
Clomid or you can give them HCG. Um, in some circumstances, we even use FSH and that is recommended. Uh, or you got to identify why their testosterone is low. Are they obese? Uh, do they have high estrogen levels? Are they smoking? Are they drinking? Are they using marijuana? Are they on a testosterone blocker for hair or um, you know, other reasons? So uh, there are different things we need to look at to address, but you can correct it. It's first an issue of figuring out why the testosterone is low, and then secondly, addressing it. And there are multiple different ways to do that, but they, they can be successful. Yeah. Is it possible Great for embryos that are graded well and PGT normal to still be poor quality? Can egg and sperm just not be compatible? Um, okay, so the first question is, can genetically normal eggs, or sorry, embryos, still be poor quality? And the answer is yes. So you can have normal genetics, but have poor energy efficiency, poor cytoskeleton, poor mechanics inside the embryo, and that can result in a failed, um, a failed pregnancy or failed attempt. Uh, so the opposite can also be true where the embryo will even implant, but then can turn into a uh, not genetically abnormal infant, but a abnormal infant, infant in terms of um, organ structure or brain development or heart development or whatever. So uh, we've had that happen before where we had a patient who uh, is very near and dear to me. I really loved her. She was a wonderful lady. Um, we made three genetically normal embryos for her. We put the first one in. She got pregnant on first try and then ended up having a baby with multiple anomalies. So genetically normal does not mean the embryo is good quality it just means it's genetically normal you can still have failures uh, as far as the second part of the question what what was the second part again can egg and sperm oh not never be compatible. be compatible yeah not that we're aware of um, there's nothing anywhere that has ever shown that sperm and eggs can be incompatible um, there is some data about um, uh, certain genes that are related to DQ uh, genes, and people are saying that that can make it much harder. Uh, DQ alpha, not everybody agrees with that, and the science is still not 100% there, um, but there is some data to support that, and it's something we're starting to look at, but it's still not 100%. It's one of those um, as yet unresolved dilemmas in fertility. All right, from YouTube. Hi, Dr. Victory. You too. For male infertility, low sperm motility, and low ejaculate volume, what are the chances that antibiotic for WBC frozen mm -hmm. pee staying cool and vitamin will help natural conception? Uh, reasonable. So if you have lots of white blood cells, you need to get on antibiotics. Um, keeping your testicles cool has been proven to help. Uh, vitamins can help a lot. So it, it depends on the criteria. I mean, if you have one million sperm, those things are not going to help. Um, you know, they're, they're, that's too low a count. But if you have a count that's in the, let's say 10 million range or 12 million, and you need to get over that, you know, sort of 15 million threshold, you probably can with those techniques. And that will normalize you enough, hopefully, to improve things. It also depends on the other parameters of the sperm. How many are moving? How fast are they moving? How many of them are normal? What's the DNA fragmentation like? But all of those things you mentioned can improve those factors. So it's worth trying for sure. And, and I'm a big supporter of doing natural things to try and improve your fertility. So give it a shot um, for the cold testicles, uh, 20 minutes on um, per day. So sit on frozen peas and for God's sakes, don't feed them to people, please. Hello, Dr. V. Excuse Do you me. have any advice to help reduce endometriosis symptoms and pain naturally? Yeah, so we have a whole video dedicated to that. Um, there's a video a few months back looking at natural treatments for endometriosis. So check that out. So NAC, uh, turmeric, um, inositol, uh, omega-3 fatty acids. There are all sorts of natural treatments you can do. Have a uh, low calorie diet. Um, you don't want to generate a lot of uh, fat or uh, adipose tissue because that produces more estrogen. The estrogen stimulates the endo. Um, yeah, avoid anything inflammatory, avoid foods that are really processed or have a lot of hormones in them. So more of the organic foods, 
uh, all of that can be beneficial. Yeah, and there are loads of nutritionists who can help you in that regard. Um, any look at Instagram will show you 10 million different uh, so-called nutrition endo experts. I think probably, you know, 99% of them are quacks, but there is 1% out there that are the real deal. So if you watch our video, we specify from an actual scientific article what things work and which ones don't. So check that out for sure. Maybe Tara can get that one, uh, that one up on the video. <laughs> yeah. I just got my FSH back and it's 10.5 and my estradiol is 25. However, okay. my AMH is 2 <coughs> and LH is 6.3. Okay. Does this still point to a low ovarian reserve? I'm 36. If your AMH is two uh, nanograms per mil, no. If it's two picomoles per liter, yes. So FSH and LH are not helpful. Estrogen is totally unhelpful. Uh, we don't use those very much anymore to determine what your ovarian reserve is. AMH is pretty useful. It's not the be all and end all. It's just a number, but it is a reasonable uh, assessment or um, sort of ability to predict how you're going to do. And if your AMH is two picomoles per liter, that's a very low AMH level. If your AMH is two nanograms per mil, that's actually a very reasonable AMH level. So it depends on which units you're talking about, NG per ml or PMOL per liter. Can taking DHDA delay your period, or could this be a sign of a elevated DHDA? Um, you'd have to take a ton of DHEA to delay your period, but you could be pregnant and you should not be taking DHEA if you're pregnant. So my advice would be get a preg test right away and immediately stop your DHEA until you have further assessment. <clears throat> Hi, Dr. Victory. I'm looking forward. He said that like I was somebody else that time. <laughs> you know how it, it, it confused me. Uh, yeah, so I'm looking forward for a fourth FET with our last embryo in storage after March. Okay. What do you recommend us in preparation? What's that including question to ask to our doctor? Um, okay, so I'm assuming you're not with us, but uh, regardless, uh, I would ask about what they can change to improve things for you compared to what they've done before. I'd ask about what testing you've had done um, to make sure they've tested you for everything possible. I would not do an embryo transfer if it's your fourth try without having all the testing and treatments that are available to you being done. Um, and then find out if they've done the basics. So are they talking to you about an HCG wash? Are they gonna use letrozole? Are you on melatonin? Have they checked your ferritin and your vitamin D? Those are like the most basic things, plus the uh, vaginal microbiota. So taking the um, probiotics vaginally. Uh, all of those things can be very simple, easy tweaks, not particularly expensive, in fact, quite cost effective, that can actually make a huge difference in your success rates, and many of which are kind of a natural approach to things. So I would try all of those, but if it's your fourth because you failed three times before, you need to make sure that you know why you failed before and then address the reason for the failure. So infection, immune system, bad transfer technique, uh, bad embryo quality, um, you know, endometriosis, whatever the case is, you have to address the source problem. So I, I know a lot of fertility centers kind of tend to just do IVF and when it doesn't work, they go, oh, sorry, it didn't work. Like, let's try again. Well, that's great if you're not paying for it. Um, even then, it's still not really great because you got to put your body through the drugs. There's a ton of emotional trauma or damage that comes from the failure your stress level goes through the roof your relationship is jeopardized it epically screws up your sex life so there's a lot of baggage and damage that comes along with failing an ivf cycle i am not a fan of just railroading people through ivf in fact i'm quite the opposite we really push 
to try and get patients to only do the IVF cycle when they need it, number one, and then when they need it, we wanna make sure it's perfect and it works hopefully on first try. So I wanna dot every I and cross every T before you're getting into multiple embryo transfer to make sure I've done everything possible to maximize your success. So if they're just pushing you, let's try again, let's try again, let's try again, that is not a great idea and I certainly don't practice that way. First and only IUI tomorrow before moving on to IVF. Limited number of frozen sperm, so not able to mess around with too many IUIs. Okay. Any advice? Should sex or exercise be avoided for a few days? No, uh, we've got YouTube videos on that too. <laughs> Poor Tarek. <laughs> He's terrified now that every two seconds you gotta put a pointer up to a video. So um, we have video on that. Uh, it's actually encouraged to have sex. So. Um, should you swing from the chandelier, as I always like to say? Probably not, no wild sex, but you should have sex because the more sperm that's there, the better your chances are. So I would actually advise you to do it. So if there is sperm available, um, go ahead. If you're just having sex for the sake of having sex, if it helps you reduce your stress, you should do it. Um, so for example, if your partner is azoospermic, um, from a cancer or a vasectomy or whatever the case is, and that's why you have the frozen sperm samples, um, I would still recommend you have sex, but mainly if it's going to reduce your, your stress level. Because obviously from a fertility standpoint, it's not helping, but from a stress level it does, and then that in turn can affect your fertility chances. Does Letrozole help with thickening lining for FUT? I previously had trouble getting a lining thick enough with estradiol and the patches? Not usually. In fact, if anything, it may thin your lining a little bit, but they've never proven that. So we don't use uh, letrozole to thicken your lining. Um, we use vitamins, so C, D, and E can do that. Aspirin can help, Viagra can help, um, PRP can actually help. There are studies that have supported that. We've reviewed that on the show as well. Um, yeah, those are the majority of the things we try. And then different routes of administration of the estrogen. So uh, oral, transdermal, vaginal, um, there are different ways to give it and sometimes people react differently each time. Um, how long post DNC would it take for anthrombin three levels? Antithrombin. Antithrombin three levels to return to normal. Is seven weeks long enough? Yeah. I was going to say six, six weeks, so seven weeks is plenty. Should be back to normal by then. Hi, Dr. V. For male infertility, low sperm motility, and low ejaculate volume, what are the chances that antibiotic for WBC, frozen feet? Oh, we did that. I think we, uh, yeah, we answered that question. So hopefully you were watching earlier, but uh, um, I need more information, but the antibiotics and the vitamins can help. Do you know when Canada will be open back up? I'm waiting to fly over to come meet with you. I wish I did. Uh, you're welcome to try and ring uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, but I don't know his number. <laughs> uh, it is unknown. I will tell you that um, as of yesterday, being vaccinated is insufficient to make you avoid quarantine. Now, you can fly into Canada. No one's going to tell you you can't. The problem with coming into Canada is that you have to quarantine once you're here. So until they change the regulations regarding quarantine, I'd probably recommend it's too expensive to come in. You gotta go to a hotel first, then you gotta wait for 14 days in another place. It, it's a nightmare. Um, but I'm suspecting that because the CDC in the US has just recently said that if you've been vaccinated, you no longer need to quarantine even if you're directly exposed to COVID positive, you know, status. So hopefully Canada will follow suit, but who knows? Like, I don't have anything to do with making up those rules. I wish I did, but I don't. Um, thanks so much. Uh, if your <laughs> issue is male infertility, does IVF for the first child automatically mean I would need IVF for the future second? second? Um, it depends on how severe your male factor is. We do find many times that couples that do IVF have an easier time of getting pregnant naturally the second time around. 
I don't know if it's because your body kind of learns what it's doing or the stress is gone and that magically kind of improves things. But we do know that couples do frequently have an easier time second time around, but it really depends. I mean, if you have extremely poor sperm performance, it's not like that's just gonna suddenly disappear. So it you know, is highly dependent on your status, your parameters from your semen analysis. But yes, there is a chance that it'll work better after you've had a success. Great question. Actually, no one's asked us that ever, I think. Yeah, good question. I, I don't respond to Provera to bring on period, but I do respond to birth control. Is there any difference or pros or cons of using one over the other to bring on a period before starting Letrozole or other medications to help ovulation? Also, thanks for everything you do. I appreciate all the help more than you could possibly know. Uh, well, you're welcome and thank you for saying thank you. Um, so if you're not responding to Provera, there's only three reasons. One, you are pregnant. Two, you have such high androgen levels that you are uh, unable to produce a lining or um, you are not producing enough estrogen because you're either suppressed or your ovaries aren't working properly like you're premenopausal. And then the final, or, or exercise induced or whatever the case is. Uh, and then the final reason is that you're obstructed but that would not allow the birth control pill to work. So you're not obstructed, we know that. Um, so if it's just Provera that's not working, in all likelihood, the most common issue would be that you are not producing estrogen. So you need to figure out if you're not producing because you're suppressed or you're not producing because your ovaries are failing. So if your ovaries are failing, um, that's obviously a problem. You have very, very little time. You gotta jump on doing whatever you gotta do to get pregnant. But if you're suppressed, so that's typically stress, eating disorder, or excessive exercise, you got, you got to fix whichever one of those it is and then move forward from there. Um, would, oh, would DOR patient have less chance of a successful IUI compared to those who don't have DOR? For sure. So if you have diminished ovarian reserve, your chances of success with IUI are lower. Yeah, because as we showed in that other study, there's higher cancellation, both studies, higher cancellation rates, possibly a higher chance of having genetically abnormal embryos overall, and therefore lower chances of success. Hi, Dr. V. I have PCOS. My husband has a low count and motility. We have done four IUIs, one successful by chance, but then miscarried at 11 weeks. Oh, I'm sorry. Should we continue with IUIs or move on? So if you watch our other video, it says that if you're less than 40, um, up to six tries of IUI is reasonable. After that, there's no further chance of success. So we never recommend more than six. Um, and again, it does depend on how low the sperm count is. I mean, if he's negligible, it's really low, I wouldn't do it any more than four times. If it's reasonable, like he's in the millions after the wash and uh, there's several million, like more than 5 million, ideally more than 14. Yeah, I mean, I would probably try one or two more times as long as it's not crazy expensive. So um, at our clinic, we really are very, very cost efficient for our IUI. It's 350 to 450 when we have funding from the government or if you're willing to take a drive to our Sarnia clinic. Um, if you're going through other places, I've spoken to patients from the U.S. who were paying like, $1,500, $2,000 just for the sperm prep. I mean, that's insane. And that's in US dollars. So if you're spending that much money, save your money, do IVF. But if it's cheap, yeah, I would try again as long as the sperm count is adequate. Here's an interesting question. <clears throat> I've All never right. heard it before. Okay. Is there a certain type of massage that assists with ovulation? Um, so there is a certain deep tissue massage. It starts with an M. Um, I can't remember the name now. Uh, that some people believe can do all sorts of effective things like improve ovarian blood flow and reduce adhesion formation and 
um, you know, correct hormonal imbalances and all of that stuff. Uh, respectfully, um, I think that's just a total load of nonsense. So um, I don't believe there's a shred of evidence anywhere that suggests that um, somehow trying to massage the ovary trans-abdominally. To the extent that it's called a Mayan abdominal massage. Um, no, there's another one that starts with an M. It's named after a guy. It's not Mayan. Um, so, so keep in mind, your ovary is actually biologically well protected. You've got your skin, fat, a uh, tough layer called your fascia, probably a little bit more fat, um, muscle, peritoneum, and then your insides, which have an air cushion, bowels floating around in there as well, and then your ovaries hidden flop down towards your back. So it's like in an average, even slim woman, probably two or three inches away from the front wall of your abdomen. So for any woman, if I put three inches of pressure on you, like I depress your belly by three inches, you're going to kick me in the balls. Like, I mean, let's be honest here, that would kill. So I don't understand what people think they're doing because you can't massage an ovary externally. And for any woman that's had to endure a pelvic exam, my apologies when we have to do it to check you, it hurts, it's uncomfortable. We're shoving a finger in vaginally beside your cervix and going all the way up towards the ovary and then pressing down. And even then, I don't press hard because it's hella uncomfortable. So for someone to massage like that, like you'd be crying in pain. So if you want to endure that kind of pain because hypothetically, and it's purely conjecture, it's going to improve things. Okay, great. Go for it. But does it actually improve things? No. And a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to speak to a practitioner of this from Sweden. And she claimed she had helped people and, and God bless her. Hopefully she has. It was like two thousand dollars per treatment to to massage the ovaries and then people would go and do one more cycle of IVF and it was successful well this is a golden example of where you need a randomized control trial where half the group gets the massage the other ha group half of the group doesn't get the massage but everybody tries just one more cycle of IVF to see if they're successful or not because I can promise you that without that kind of data, you don't know whether or not that deep tissue massage is, is valid or not. Um, acupuncture can change your blood flow. And we know that because it's actually demonstrable. You can measure blood flow on an ultrasound. I'm not aware of any ultrasound studies for these deep, deep tissue massage theories, but I'll look it up. Maybe I can bring that up. Maybe that's next Absolutely week's fact or fiction. We got to do that next week. Okay, you know what? We're going to do that next week for fact or fiction. That'll be a good topic. Massage and IVF. All right. You've got to go three inches deep. Three inches deep, yeah. Yeah, don't know. Yeah, don't do that. That's like torture. I mean, how could anyone endure that? If someone poked me three inches in my belly, I'd kick them. Yeah, don't, don't be doing that. That's torture to your ovaries. Hello, Dr. B. What embryo transfer is better after endometriosis surgery, fresh or frozen? Whoa, never fresh. So never, never, never fresh for endometriosis. It makes absolutely zero biological sense. Your endo is in full tilt effect because your estrogen levels are the highest they're going to be at any point in your life. That is the worst time to put in an embryo. And remember, even if they've operated on you, you never get rid of all of the endo. So it should always be frozen when you have endometriosis. That's a total no-brainer. Never do a fresh. If, you're, if your center wants to do a fresh embryo transfer for you and you have bad endo, they have no idea what they're doing. Like, it literally just makes absolutely no biological sense whatsoever at all. I have a super T-shaped uterus. What's involved in the surgery to reshape the uterus and what's the recovery time? Uh, recovery is instantaneous. Um, we got to go in with a camera and then either using scissors or this little electrical doohickey, you basically can cut the sides. 
um, and you take the T-shape and you make it normal again. So um, I'll draw it out for you guys. Okay, so if that's what your very T-shaped uterus looks like, can you see that on the video? Yeah, is that better? That's better. Okay, so if that's what your T-shaped video or uterus looks like, we just trim back these sides. so that it looks normal. So it's supposed to look like an upside down piece of pie. Um, so that's what you want it to look like, or an ice cream cone. So you don't want those notches. You wanna get rid of the notches. So we just trim off the notches basically. Um, recovery is instantaneous. You might have some cramping, but um, that's about it. I do put a balloon in there to hold it open afterwards. Not all my patients love me for doing that. So my apologies to those of you that have had to endure it, but it does improve the chances that it'll stay normal. Hello, Dr. Victory. And your sidekick are great clots every week. There we go. <laughs> sidekick, um, dude, <laughs> you're my sidekick. I love it. <laughs> Batman and Robin. Um, I noticed a question earlier that was accidentally skipped, but re-asking as I am also wondering, referral was sent through around four weeks ago. What's the typical timeline to hear for an initial consult? Oh, four to six weeks um, normally, and we'll let you know about uh, doing a consult. So it doesn't take too, too long. Um, we are getting very, very busy, so I'm bringing on some uh, new staff to help us. Uh, Dr. Carrie Mayrand, who um, some of you know, either because she's seen you after a pregnancy or because she's been part of the uh, fertility calls, will be joining us. And hopefully this summer, I have another physician joining us from the US, um, but I'm not allowed to talk about that yet until we figure out what's going on with her visa status. So um, we'll see and uh, we will let you know when she lets us know. Um, but Dr. Mayran will be taking over some of our consults for us and she is being trained right alongside me. So um, she's a wonderful, wonderful person, uh, really, really, really intelligent, incredibly intelligent lady, and very, very sweet. So um, you'll have very good experiences with her. And I kind of quarterback it all, so I still know what's going on in the background, and we make sure that you're getting the exact same care as you would get from me when you're with her. Uh, time update 903. You tell me, five more minutes, 910? Give the people what they need. Give the people what they want? Yeah, okay, 910, 915. Are, are there some good questions? We got some oh, yes. rock and rollers? All right, all right, let's go. All right, does blood result prolong your period or spotting post period? Alternatively, does a miscarriage prolong your period spotting in subsequent cycles? Uh, letrozole can prolong your period because typically you ovulate around day 17, um, sometimes as late as 18. So that'll give you a 31 or 32 day cycle. So depending on your normal cycle length, it can extend it a little bit. In regards to uh, miscarriage, um, oh, and sorry, and letrozole shouldn't cause spotting. Uh, if you're spotting after miscarriage, you need to have something called a saline infusion sauna histogram or hysteroscopy to make sure there's no tissue or a polyp or a fibroid or something like that. You shouldn't be spotting after letrozole. You shouldn't be spotting after a miscarriage um, if it's been more than a few months after the initial miscarriage. First month, maybe, but not beyond that. Yeah, great question. So make sure you get checked out because you don't want to walk around with tissue inside you. That's got its own set of risks. Hi, Dr. Victory. What are natural ways to treat a lean PCOS? Is it true that it's harder to treat a leaner PCOS? Um, it's not harder. It's just that we can't give you metformin. So letrozole still works well. NAC and Ocetol and coenzyme Q10. Um, they've actually done studies in the lean and the non-lean patients, and they both benefit. So uh, make sure you're just using NAC, NAC, so that's N-acetylcysteine, inositol, and coenzyme Q10. And the omega-3 fish oils help as well, the DHA. What do you find to be the most common cause of secondary infertility? <laughs> uh, lack of sex, because the first kid is keeping you um, exhausted. Uh, um, 
So most common cause of secondary infertility. I don't know that there is a single most common cause of secondary infertility because it depends so much on what the initial problem was. More and more, I'm going to say it's likely going to be male factor. But in the absence of male factor, um, you know, you can eliminate the easy things like it's not going to be ovarian reserve because it's probably only been a short period of time and ovarian reserve generally speaking, doesn't change that quickly. It's not gonna be your tubes being blocked because that's not something that unblocks after an initial pregnancy. So you're either not making eggs, your hormones are screwy because you've gained weight or lost weight or whatever the case, or you're stressed because you're not sleeping because you have a child to chase around, um, or it's male factor. So those would be the kind of more common causes of it just rationally deducting. Good question. No one's asked us that one either. That was a good question. That was a good question. I like that one. Yeah. All right. Lots of applause and hearts and thumbs up for that one. Yeah. Uh, where can I find how much egg sperm donation costs if that person is a family member? Is it the same cost? Um, so, uh, no, it's not the same cost. So, um, where you find it is by calling the agencies. Rough estimate in Canada, rough estimate. Um, minimum about six to eight thousand for an egg donation, maximum around 20. Um, they do vary drastically between the different agencies. Sperm, um, you can buy donated sperm for eight to nine hundred dollars. So that's pretty standard across the board. As far as a family member, um, you cannot pay for anything but their expenses. So it should be free or very close to free. So um, same thing with an egg donor agency, you can't pay for anything but the egg donor's expenses, but they calculate it somehow that works it out to those relatively high numbers. So um, if it's a family member, it's much, much less expensive. And we have done that all the time. Like I love it when we do that. Um, we actually just did it for a sister and um, we do it for cousins and sisters and brothers and all sorts of things all the time. So. Uh, just give us a call and we'll chat with you about how much that costs. It depends on what you're doing and how you're doing it. But um, with eggs, obviously, you have to do IVF. With sperm, it, it doesn't require IVF. So there are ways to achieve that um, that are very cost effective for you. Yeah, great question again. Um, I have a question for you guys. What can we do to improve our uh, uptake on Instagram? So we put up lots of great information. Um, I think we have good posts, some of them well-liked, um, mostly the ones about me and my family rather than the info. But nevertheless, uh, engagement in Instagram is tough. YouTube growing bonkers, like 20 people a day, 30 people a day, 28,000 views, 16,000, 10,000, like our YouTube channel is doing great. But on Instagram, it's super tough. So I wanna know what you guys think we should do to help our Instagram community grow. And so if you're watching on Instagram, tell us what we can do to improve it. I would love your feedback and your comments. Um, that would help us or, or share, help us share what we do with others. So reach out to your friends, family, whatever, and tell them you know that if they're interested or they're struggling that uh, we're the place to go to let us know because it's really important to us to help as many people as we can and growing our community is really critical but instagram is impossible to grow if you are uh, um, struggling to do it and you're trying to help people i don't know what the catch is but it's tough youtube no problem our youtube videos are doing incredibly well but uh, on our other platform, Instagram, it's really quite a challenge. So I am super keen to see. Maybe you guys can give us comments and we'll stay on another five minutes to see what you guys say. If everybody that is, uh, you know, a follower um, told one person to share, we double in, in like a week, right? So it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. I keep wondering why it doesn't happen, but... Uh, um, so far, we haven't seen it. Tarek says we need to have like a giveaway. So if you think that's a good idea, let us know. Yeah, one more <clears throat> or two more. Uh, we'll see if the comments come in from the grant. Just go viral with a TikTok dance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so I love to dance. Um, I don't think any of you want to see me dance. Um, I used to go clubbing a lot when I was younger. Um, yeah, you're not going to see me twerking. Um, that's been a, a standing joke for us that 
the fastest way to grow on Instagram is to twerk. Um, I'm not going to be twerking. <laughs> Um, but if you have anything other than a TikTok dance video, let me know. Um, or maybe we do need to do it. <laughs> That's the day I don't show up. <laughs> That's the day Tarek. Tarek refuses to video me dancing. That's hilarious. We love you, Doc, and everything you do. Thank you. Oh, thank you, guys. I love you back. Uh, how much NAC and inositol for PCOS? Uh, inositol, um, it depends on which product you're using, um, anywhere from 600 to 1,000, and NAC, uh, usually about 1,000, 1,200 is what we're using. Uh, people on Instagram can share your posts and stories, so please. Yeah, so you know what? Um, share, like, comment, subscribe. Comments are always helpful if you see our posts. The more comments you put up, uh, the more we love that, so take a minute and uh, and comment. We you know always uh, try and give feedback, and I I generally um, personally answer each and every one of the Instagram comments. So if you have comments, uh, let us know. Uh, one of these days we got to do a fertility bloopers, like the guy that asked us about getting his sister pregnant. <laughs> I told you that should be a whole video. Uh, we've had some interesting experiences here in fertility world, so. All right, last yeah. question. Yeah, last one. Uh, hello, I have PCOS. I lost 40 pounds and my period came back. No issues every month. Awesome. Now I gained and I just seeing spotting. What are some ideas? I did pregnancy test negative urine. So if you've regained the weight, you got to re-lose the weight. Um, that's important. So like I always say, PCOS has three approaches. It's um, doing, are we out of battery? No, the card. Oh, the card. So we can do um, the medical stuff, which is letrozole and metformin. We can do the natural stuff, which is NAC, the N-acetylcysteine, the inositol and the coenzyme Q10. And then you can do the health stuff, which is 1,500 calorie per day diet, maximum 1,500. Six meals a day, breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, snack, and daily hardcore muscle building exercise. And as we said earlier in the show, walking is not exercise, so don't walk. You actually have to exercise to build muscle. Are we uh, set to? Is that it? Did we get any other comments about uh, how to build Instagram? I'd love to hear some. I hope none of them involve me twerking. A lot of them involve me twerking. A lot of them involve me twer twerking. Okay, guys, so uh, have a great night. Uh, definitely let us know what we can do to, to grow and to help you. If you have specific subjects or uh, you know specific concerns or questions you want us to address, we're always happy to do that. So if you think there's a, a great topic for Fact or Fiction, let us know and I'll put it up there. And also help us grow. So if you have friends that you know are struggling, tell them to follow or uh, send our posts to somebody else and get them to follow and share. Um, and always comment. Comments really help us and let us know. Stay safe, wear your masks, hand sanitize, and uh, we'll see you again next week on Fertility Factor Fiction. Have a great night, guys. Bye now.